So our final piece of the puzzle is this idea of plant hormones. And you read about some of these plant hormones for today, and we're gonna focus on four main hormones. Your book talked about a few extra ones. Uh, you notice I did not give you any reading guide questions on some of those hormones. So these are the four that you have to know. They match up with your reading guide, and you should have a general idea about what these hormones are going to do. And so, when we're talking about some plant hormones, and we're gonna, by the way, um, either next week or right after spring break, we're going to get into some animal or some human hormones that are in the endocrine system. But we're in particular talking about auxins, gibberellins, hibiscus acid, and ethylene. Now there's again a lot more hormones than just that, but these relate best to what we've been talking about in terms of some of these other plant structures. And what they do to a lot of points is they affect the height or the kind of the length, the stem elongation perhaps. They might deal with fruit, whether it ripens or not. They might deal with whether or not a leaf is going to stay on a tree or fall off a tree. Um, they might affect how that plant grows. Um, the auxins, you read about the fact that they affect that phototropism. They actually cause a plant, if you've ever seen a plant kind of leaning towards the light, it's the auxins that explain how that happens. So looking at these one by one, starting off with the auxins, the auxins control cell division and differentiation. Differentiation is when cell, one cell, um, well, when a cell decides what it's gonna do, right? You guys are very differentiated. You have lots of different cells and they have different tasks and your blood cells have a very different task than your bone cells and your skin cells have a very different task than your eyeball cells, right? So that's differentiation. As far as the phototropism goes, it was a little bit of a confusing idea and so I would recommend that if you had trouble writing the question on how auxins and phototropism are related, that you maybe check out my answer key that's on Moodle. It's not that I have the best answer, but if you're confused about it, hopefully my answer helps to clarify that, which brings up the fact that all those answer keys are on Moodle for all the reading guides for this chapter. So what's going on with this phototropism is photo, light, tropism is a response. And so it's a response towards a light, or it's not really towards light, it's a response in um, and it's because of the light. And so the reason why these plants grow, and maybe you've seen it, maybe you have a plant in your kitchen, and it's kind of off to one window, and you look at it, and it's just kind of leaning and tilting towards that. Or maybe you have a plant outside in the garden in the summer, and there's some shade around it, and you actually see that it kind of is growing towards the light spot. Well, the reason is, is because it, it depends on where this, these auxins are causing growth. Because these auxins lead to elongation, they, they, they cause cell growth. Then what happens is that you end up getting an asymmetrical distribution of auxin. And so the auxins are actually on the shaded side of the plant. All right, these auxins are being released on the shaded side of the plant. And as a result, they kind of travel down the shaded side as well. So they stay on the one side. Well, if they stimulate cell growth, that means the shaded side of the plant is growing faster than the sunny side of the plant. And so those cells are becoming longer and more numerous on the other side, which means that this side is shorter, this side is longer, so it's gonna to start to curve, right? Your longer cells are gonna cause it to curve, your shorter cells can't expand enough, so it can't straighten itself off, and so it starts to lean towards that light. And so, kind of an interesting idea, cells on the darker side elongate faster, so that would be on this side right there, then cells on the brighter side, and let's see here. The, the response of that is kind of important. I mean, obviously it's not too important in your kitchen, but in nature, right, these plants have to be able to get the sunlight, and if you're getting out-competed by another plant, and if it's blocking your sunlight, you might not be surviving. And it's all about survival, and this is, again, another mechanism that it can try to, it can try to kind of direct itself to try to maximize its light. I know at my house we have a pine tree that literally goes straight up and then it's like a 90 degree angle and like that because of that because there's a tree next to it. Okay, so. good. Um, I think we went into a little bit more detail on your reading guide about it. We kind of broke it up into some different parts as well. But basically make sure you can attribute the fact that auxins, first of all, cause that growth, right? So they, they elongate things. Um, so I thought I had a different picture of that around. But your book talked about a few other pictures about something that was treated with the auxins or something that was not treated with them, and it's definitely going to affect their growth. The gibberellins is also this hormone. It's actually a whole family of hormones, so there's different kinds of them. But it's also a hormone that's going to affect some of the growth. 
And so it too is going to lead to stem elongation. And your book talked about the fact that some growers actually use a gibberellin inhibitor. And that means what? Stop. Stops the gibberellin, prevents it from elongating the stems. And they talk about one particular type of flower that if your flowers keep growing longer, they just kind of get spindly and they look, they don't look very full and they just kind of look bare and they're kind of ugly, right? You have this house plant with all these tall, anemic looking stalks, right? Um, and so what they would actually do is treat it with a, with a blocker. They would block the gibberellin so that it could not cause this elongation. And so you get a shorter but fuller plant, which is beneficial for most people who want to buy it. That's the kind of plant they want to see. And so again, it causes an elongation. It also leads to some fruit growth. Um, in fact, here you can see a difference. The grapes on the left did not have uh, access to the gibberellins. The ones on the right were the gibberellins were actually added to it, or um, I don't know if they sprayed on it or quite how they get it in there. Um, but you can see definitely a, a bigger, plumper, juicier grape on the right side and less so on the left. And so um, growers have kind of figured this out and said, hey, well, if you're at a store, which ones are you going to buy? You're obviously going to buy the plumper ones, so let's give them this extra, um, this extra hormone to aid in their growth. And it also affects seed germination. It encourages seed germination. Your book went into a little bit more details on why, but again, it's encouraging the, um, it's encouraging a lot of that, um, the nutrients inside that seed to start to get broken down to provide the nutrients to allow that first, um, that first germination, that, that little stem um, to appear and the roots to appear as well. We won't get into the mechanism on how that works. <clears throat> then we have our acid, and this one is a little bit uh, different here. This one actually slows the growth. So we had the gibberellins, which were speeding up or elongating. We had the auxins were elongating. This acid actually slows the growth. And so what this one does is it leads to seed dormancy. So if you have high concentrations of this acid, it's going to basically prevent the germination. And so in order to get these seeds to actually germinate, it would take time for that acid to actually either become inactivated or over time it might leach off, um, or perhaps when that seed gets in, it gets uh, correct environmental or, uh, conditions, maybe part of that condition is to, to be moist, to have water around it. Well, what one of those things might be, and it might not be this acid, but in general, one of those kind of signalers might be, well, what if this had this acid on the seed, and now that it gets watered, that's kind of a sign that says, hey, it might be a good time to start growing because there's at least moisture in the soil that might wash off this acid, so now it's not affecting its growth anymore, and so now it can actually germinate. And so it's kind of a, an evolutionary advantage saying that it's going to only allow these seeds to germinate when the conditions are right. If the conditions are right, it will help to leach out this acid. If the conditions are not right, that acid stays, the seed remains dormant, and it waits things out until a better day comes along. So light temperatures, moisture, et cetera, for our germination. Again, remember that germination, we haven't talked about it specifically, but that's what your lab was based on, right? And germination is just looking to see when does that shoot first emerge out of that leaf. And so hopefully you saw that your seeds swelled a little bit. They absorb a huge amount of moisture because they're very dry initially. And that kind of causes them to swell, kind of causes their, their seed coat to crack, allows those, that first shoot and that first root to start to push out. In order to grow, it's obviously not doing photosynthesis at this point, so it has those nutrients from that endosperm inside the seed, right? Remember, you have the seed coat, you have the endosperm, which is like the food source, and then you have the embryo, which is actually like the genetic material. And so it uses that endosperm to provide enough nutrients for the roots to grow and to be able to push that shoot up out of the dirt. And then once it can put out its first leaves, then it can start to do its own photosynthesis and uh, not rely on that endosperm as much. And then finally, we have ethylene. And ethylene is a hormone gas, so it's a little bit different than some of the other ones. So it's a gas. It's released by plant cells. And what this gas does is it, uh, it basically helps fruit to ripen. It helps to break down the cell walls of fruits. And if you start to break down these cell walls, you start to make them softer, right? So if you think about eating like a pear, for example, 
that's not very ripe at all, it's like bite into a rock, right? But then as time goes on, as that fruit ripens, it gets softer and softer. And then you think about fruit that maybe is a little bit too ripe, and you bite into it, and it's like eating baby food, right? That's kind of gross, right? Again, because we broke down a lot of those cell walls. Um, it also affects leaf drop. It affects the leaf drop. And so this one encourages the, um, it encourages the leaf to separate from the stem. So it, it keeps them together. Um, the, which one had a reverse effect of this? Is it the auxins? Mm -hmm. I think it was, right? Um, so make sure you, that was one of your questions in your reading guide. Which one had the reverse effect? I think I have it right here. It said, explain how ethylene and auxin can have opposite effects. I said auxin helps to keep the leaves attached, uh, while ethylene promotes the detachment of leaves. And so ultimately what ethylene is doing is ethylene is promoting aging, promoting aging. And so part of that aging causes the leaves to fall off, and part of that aging causes the fruits to actually ripen. Yeah? Um, is that why, like, when I it's in the book, like, when you wound it, it, like, ripens faster? Is that, like, when you have cut apples, they like, brown faster? Um, I'm not sure about the browning. The browning, I think, is more of an oxidation. It's reacting with the oxygen. And it's not making, it's not really affecting anything except the color of the fruit. Um, so it's probably a little bit of a difference. But the wounding thing, I would think, would probably still hold through true because if you wound it, it's probably releasing more of that ethylene, which is going to kind of um, cause that surrounding area to mature a little bit more, to ripen a little bit more, which also leads to that whole question about why that saying one rotten apple spoils the barrel, because again, that rotten apple has a lot of ethylene, which is why it's rotting, right? It's, it's ripening, it's, it's all soft, it's releasing this. And another thing that your book said is ethylene, as you produce ethylene, that encourages more ethylene to be made. It's like a positive feedback cycle, right? So ethylene leads to more ethylene, which leads to more ethylene. And so it's releasing this gas. And if you have all these apples in a closed container or in your cupboard, it's, it, that ethylene hormone is also being felt it's being received by the other fruits, which is causing them to produce more ethylene, which is causing them to ripen faster. And so it's kind of this speed up chain effect. And so ultimately, ethylene, we get this word apoptosis that we learned a long time ago. Anyone remember what that meant? Cell death. Cell death. Good. Um, and so again, just it's basically pushing this, this plant towards cell death, towards a higher age. All right, so again, that idea of one bad apple spoils the whole bunch because of this gas being produced in there. So a little bit more about that fruit ripening. Um, and think about, on the bigger picture, why this might be important. And so we have this, uh, you have hard fruit, right? So it's not ripened. It's not only hard, but it's, it's usually not very good tasting, right? Maybe it's very tart, maybe bitter, uh, maybe sour. And so an animal doesn't really want to eat that fruit, right? So it just kind of leaves it alone. Uh, but if you have a ripe sweet fruit, right? First of all, ripe fruit also has a much more of an odor to it, right? So animals can smell it from farther away. It has a sweet, sugary taste. It's a lot easier to eat and a lot softer. And that's encouraging animals to come and eat it. And so they're not going to ripen their fruit until the seed inside them is ready to be spread. So you don't want to eat a developing fruit because that seed's not ready to pass through the digestive tract and get planted somewhere, right? And so again, it's a pretty nice adaption to make sure that the fruit or the seeds in the fruit only get planted or spread when that fruit is ready for that to do it. And so again, this ethylene triggers the ripening process by breaking down the cell wall. That softens it. It also converts starches to sugar, right? You think about, well, potatoes, a lot of starch. And you think about sugar, right? There's a pretty big difference in sweetness between those two. And again, this positive feedback system because ethylene triggers more ethylene, which triggers more ripening, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the basic effects of at least those four hormones. hormones. So be familiar with those hormones. Be familiar with what they're doing to the plants and also kind of how they might counteract each other.